Well, howdy, howdy. Hey, fellas, how's it going? What's up, B people? Everybody doing okay out there? Man, we've already got 110 folks on here, and we just what? barely got done with the intro. So wow. much fun, and I think people are excited about the season, man. We're just right here on it. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. So, guys, what's going on with y'all? Last week, Greg, I, I really appreciate you. Uh, you and Susie, you guys did just a phenomenal job with that. Uh, Love is in the air, Valentine's. Uh, and that was just phenomenal. I really think you guys handled that extremely well, and just it was incredible. And so I'm glad, glad we, we, you guys did that last week. That was really, really a neat way to fill up that evening. And and those couples you had on, and and their comments and everything. It was just just a great idea. Yeah, thanks for tuning in, Bruce. It's, it's a lot of fun because uh, you know you do all these things, uh, whether it's your life, your business, your bees. We try to do the best that we can. But the truth of the matter is, is it's this is done as a team, and it's not always easy uh, to make all these things happen. And there's uh, high points on the mountaintop, and there are points where you're in the valley and everything in between. And uh, if if you're not performing as a team, um, at least for us as a couple, you know, if we don't put God first and we aren't tight as a unit, nothing works, and you are you are not making. Um, any progress in anything and you are constantly spinning your wheels and you're stuck in the mud and you're stuck in the muck and the grime and the guts that in the blood of life and that leads to a whole uh, different experience than if you're living life of joy and happiness and you put god first even when, when the tough times um he's there he's there in the good times too and so it was fun for us to be able to share what works for us in our marriage keeping all these things together but more importantly bringing in so many other couples who are beekeepers and homesteaders into the conversation and sharing their three tips on how they're keeping it all together. And there was, it was, it was such a blessing to learn that so many of us have the number one thing is putting God first and then everything That's else right. follows. So if you haven't checked yeah. that one out, check over yeah. it. later on tomorrow, or check out that uh, Valentine's day chat with, uh, with Susie and I, it was, uh, we hope it, it was a blessing for you for sure. I think I'll go into the description when this is over and try to put that in there. So if folks want to, you know, don't worry about trying to find it now, but afterwards I'll try to remember to go in and put a link to that video. Cause that was a phenomenal video for you. Um, and I thought it was cool. Faith, family, and communication seemed to be the top three yep. things that, you know, people had little variations on that, maybe a little bit different, but those seem to be the top three categories and pretty much in that order of people who are successfully running families and uh, be businesses and homesteads and, living life in general, successful lives. And so I thought that was pretty neat. So uh, Brian, how's things, how are things going with you guys? Good, good. Um, we are, I'm going to, I'm going to start using like other, other beekeepers terminology. We are fixing to get crazy up here. Mm -hmm. um, we, I, I went over just uh, for a quick second today, just to check on the colonies and see what they were doing. And I mean, they were just going gangbusters. So, the ones that I have left, I think are going to be okay. Activity just looked amazing on them. Um, but we are weather wise, uh, we are probably going to have the earliest spring that I've ever seen in my beekeeping years in Northeast Ohio. We have maples that are ready to burst. Um, in the next two weeks, we only have like two or three days where it's going to dip below 32 but it's like 29 31 stuff like that so it's not like it's a real hard hard freeze so things are just i mean they're they're primed and ready and if you're not going to be ready up here i mean you're just going to run behind in the spring because it's it's going to come on you super fast this year yeah so. that's kind of crazy and i before we move on, though, I'd like to kind of look. I'm looking in the comments here, and first of all, I'm amazed that we already have 144 people in here, and we're not even 10 wow. minutes in. Second of all, I'm seeing a lot of names in here, a lot of familiar names, and there's just really no way we can name them all because they're coming in fast and furious. But I also seeing some new names in here, folks that, that if you've been on here before, I haven't seen you, or it's kind of you know the, the comments come in so fast. So we just really appreciate everyone being in here. I, I thought it was kind of funny. I started one of the comments that I saw here from Roy. I'll show it right here. Roy, a pro or prow says, hello, my name is Roy, and I've had this addiction for beekeeping going on, going on five years. I need mental help. And I think we're all in that situation right now, kind of. It's that time of the year when, um, 
you know, we're all, you know, and down here in Alabama, obviously we're, we're going gangbusters already, but um, we still, we're not quite full into bee season yet, but you guys up there are just right on the cusp. Wherever you live, it's not far away. Even if, if even if it's May before you get into them, that's not very far away. So, uh, Greg, what about your neck of the woods? So I guess you're seeing similar things to Brian. I know it's a little bit, you're a little bit regionally located differently, but what are you seeing there in, in uh, eastern Ohio up there? Well, Bruce, this is going to be a, a fun talk tonight because um, I've had these conversations with folks so many times. This is the time of year it pops up because there are folks who are excited about beekeeping and they want to get in there and they feel like they've got direction and doing the thing. And then you hear all the, well, I got to be careful how we say this. Um, I don't know if we call them social media beekeeping warriors uh, that are experts. And um, the beekeeping season can't start until the social media experts give you permission to go ahead and start your beekeeping season. And if you even use the word like pollen patty or pollen sub or feed or brood inspection, it's all of a sudden, ah, you know, how, how dare you? If, you? if you do these things, the bees are gonna brood up overnight and then this weekend's cold snap is gonna kill all the brood and your bees are gonna be left suffering and you should in no way, shape or form be doing any of those things until and they have a magic date and time. And, and folks, I am here to say, if you are tuned in and look at a couple basic things, the bees, what they're actually doing, you look at the trees and you look at the ground, those things will tell you everything. When you're waking up in the morning and you're hearing all the birds and you're hearing, you're starting to see all of the flowers start to pop up through the ground soil and you're seeing the trees bud out and come up full of life. They aren't waiting on the social media experts to say spring has sprung. So I would encourage folks, spend time learning your signs. And when you have that tug on your heart and you have that green light, you do what's best for your bees and don't look back. Don't wait around for permission from social media experts to tell you it's time to go. That being sure. said, what I'm seeing is the maples are getting ready to absolutely explode. I'm talking, we're looking at within the next three days, we should have bloom all over the place. What does that mean? That means the bees are going to be starting to gather and collect and start bringing things in very soon. So right now is the perfect time for us to go ahead and put pollen patties on, get out just ahead of bloom with protein and start giving the things that they need. Why do we do that? We're going to talk a lot more about that tonight, I think, Bruce, on what we're doing for spring. But I want folks to understand you have control of your beekeeping and your bees. If you feel like it's time for you to get started, get started. Don't wait around for permission from somebody else to do so. And that's probably all I want to say about that for now. Well, the danger with that is even in the same county, you could be seeing different things. So if you have someone who lives in, you know, New Mexico telling you what to do in Ohio, then there's a problem there because, you know, I noticed that in my bee yards, you know, 20, 30 miles apart, it can be, you know, totally different. This year I've really experienced that with the difference between Ozark and my other areas. And so it can be a completely different ball game, a completely different, you know, depending on if it's wooded area, if it's a farming area, you know, here we have areas of nothing but woods like Ozark. And then we also have a lot of farming fields where we got the, you know, wild mustard blooming. Some people call it wild radish all over the place and, and they're bringing in pollen like crazy. But if you don't have uh, farmer's fields and things like that nearby, if it's just wooded, you don't get that bloom. So, you know, you just gotta be super careful of listening to what other people tell you you should or shouldn't be doing. Um, and here in Alabama, um, you know, a lot of people are seeing the same thing. I'm especially in South Alabama It's kind of a, you're getting kind of a somewhat of a consensus down here as far as what people are seeing. But even still, you figure in the different types of bees, the different breeds of bees, feral bees, you're going to have a little bit of everything. I mean, there's so many variables. So you really have to read your bees, learn how to see what they're doing, and then make your own decisions. I think it's a great idea to counsel with each other and to see what's going on in other parts of the country. But ultimately, the decision is yours as to what you do with your bees. And you can't, you can't let somebody else um, kind of tell you what to do. Now, obviously, if, you, if you're if you new in it and you need a mentor to kind of help walk you through things and give you ideas, that's great. 
but don't just let someone who lives three states away tell you what you should or shouldn't be doing. That's just not how it works. Um, and yep. some people who may not have a mentor close by or may not have be connected with, with people, you know, reach out to me, Brian or Greg, or, or someone else, you know, that might be on YouTube or in, on social media, kind of in your area and just ask questions, but don't feel like what they say has to be the gospel truth as far as what you do. Just, just glean from everybody and then try things and figure out what works best for you. That's kind of what I've done over the years. And sometimes it works really well. And if you've seen my videos, you know, sometimes it doesn't work well, but that's the only way you can learn is by doing it yourself and reading the bees. And once you learn how to read the bees, then you're, you're going to be able to make decisions and do things um, to be successful. But even still, sometimes you have some loss and some problems. And so that's kind of the, the very frustrating thing about beekeeping is that, that you, no matter what you do, you lose some sometimes. It's also the cool thing about it because you're always trying to put that puzzle together and figure it out. Working with nature, with the bees and with other people, other beekeepers to try and, and uh, be successful. So, yeah. So uh, down here uh, right now, obviously, if you see my videos, uh, you know, I spent so much time and effort trying to you know work on that Ozark yard. And I think we're going to end up with some nice colonies up there. I hope so. But I've kind of decided in that situation i got the hive beetles numbers way down that i think it was a little bit too late on some of those colonies i lost a bunch of them but i'm going to kind of see what happens up there um with those bees and the ones that pull through i think are going to be hopefully some really good bees and nice bees and so it's kind of turned into a survival of the fittest and we're going to see what happens because i've i've done poured all kinds of resources and done everything i knew how to do with them and so now we're going to see what happens i've had to turn my focus elsewhere I'm um, with my bees that are leaving me behind a little bit. So um, I've been working really hard on my other bee yards. Uh, this past weekend, I'm working on a video right now. I invited my uh, mentee, my Highs for Heroes mentee, Lynn Warren. I'm not sure if she's oh, on here tonight. She jumps in here sometimes. But uh, she came and her and her um, husband came and they helped me make splits. I, I did, you know, it just seems like it's this way with, with queens or with beekeeping. You know, you, you have nice warm weather here, beautiful springtime weather, first part of February. So I ordered some queens out of Hawaii. I'm going to try. I hope they do well. And I ordered them for this past weekend. Well, what happens this past weekend? You know, the previous weekend, it was beautiful spring type weather. So Friday, I go out there with Lynn and Dave, and we start breaking, start pulling splits out. It's cloudy. The bees are not happy. It's just one of those deals where you can almost feel the barometric pressure dropping. It's just a just kind of that weird feel like you know a storm's rolling in. But I've got 20 queens. I got to figure out what to do with. Actually, ended up having 21. He put an extra one in there for me. But um, so so we're out there making. We pull nine splits. I move them over to Slocum, and about the time I'm leaving uh, Appland Farms, it starts drizzling. Decided not to finish the splits that day. So I went home, took the queens back to the house. And uh, the next morning I showed up in Slocum Pools. You know, I thought at the time 11 splits from there. And I got the queens in the hot the splits I pulled the day before. And all this is going to be in the video. But I got the queens in there. And then I started pulling splits. And what happens as soon as I start pulling splits? You guys Rain. have any idea? It started raining. <laughs> but I had to get them done. It wasn't like a torrential downpour i'd almost rather it be a torrential downpour because usually those come and go but it was like a little i've got family in seattle it was like a seattle type drizzle okay. drizzle drizzle getting colder the whole time getting colder colder it was just miserable and i had to get it done the bees were so mad and so fired up <laughs> brian's playing i can't get my computer to do that brian but anyway so um i got them pulled and got out back to back to Apple farms with the i brought the nukes over there with the splits went ahead and started putting queens in there and realized I had an extra queen. So I had 20 splits done and, and it actually the, the temperature was dropping. It was getting windy and it's kind of Appland farms is kind of out in the open. So you can, you can really feel the wind. It was not really a good time to be doing this. And, uh, and, uh, the rain was done, but it was, you know, how the temperature starts to drop. And so I had to figure out how to pull another split from the bees that I had just split the day before. And I actually, I got it done, but man, it, and then this weekend, what's it going to be? beautiful spring type weather you know mid to upper 60s 70s sunny so you know that's how it always works right have any of you guys ever experienced that where <laughs> anyway so that's kind of what i've been doing down here and trying to post a video with each each kind of activity and event i'm doing obviously right now it's real busy i can't post everything i'm doing but even caught a swarm in that little 
uh, starting of the rain on Friday when I put those uh-huh. little storm hanging in a tree and I just I just shook those bees on a on a on some comb and stuck it in the hive and they next morning I came back and they were all in the little snook and so it was kind of funny but it's game on here but you know we're still just uh-huh. a little ways away from my hundred percent full on beekeeping but we're pretty much the bees are on they're doing their thing and it's just a matter of keeping up with them now so Man. so that's where we're at now so um, anyway kind of talking to our crowd here we got 210 folks on here oh and uh oh. we've i appreciate the super chat my brian and greg both you jumped in early and did that for me the super chats so i really appreciate those and that means a lot uh you know we when we do these videos uh it just kind of helps helps uh the channel and the our stream team uh keep moving forward so um i'd like for you and actually i see there's some questions coming in um, what I kind of like to do, Brian, maybe you could flag some of this stuff. And, and obviously, just remember, folks, we can't probably address every single comment or question. But if you have questions, if you can maybe put them in all caps, we'll try and address some of those towards the end of the stream tonight or as we go along. And then also, if you want to kind of share with the crowd here um, what what your plans are for this year, like maybe how many colonies, if you'd like to grow, if you want to focus on hunting, just kind of put some ideas down here in the comments so people can share those a little bit. And we'll try and pull some of those out and, and share them in, in our comments tonight as we discuss the upcoming year. But the goal with tonight's video is the title is looking ahead to a new beekeeping season. And right now is the time when everyone's doing that. I see folks sharing videos now and I, I talk to people. Everybody's excited right now because we are right on the edge of that beekeeping season. Oh, yeah. So... I guess, uh, Brian, why don't we start with you, kind of what you're looking ahead towards this year, kind of what your plans are, what your thoughts are just coming up here in the next couple of months and what your goals are for this year. Oh, man. How much time do we have here? It's what, 820? (laughs) (laughs) Well, so here in the next week or two, in fact, when I was over, I, I stopped over today and was letting the pups play. And when I was looking at the colonies, Um, my, a goal that I have for the next week or so, and I'm probably going to end up doing it this weekend. I think it's going to be a hair chilly. I think we're going to be about 44 or so. So it'll be, it'll be perfect for me to do that is I've got like the extra super heavy duty, um, like weed fabric that I'm going to lay a strip of that under both rows of my colonies get those all set up, get some pavers, like uh, a couple of my hive stands don't have pavers under them. So I'm going to get everything there set up and ready. I want to be at 15 colonies. So I'm going to set up like where there's the empty spots. I've shifted some hive stands. I'm going to get everything set. Um, And that way I'll know positioning wise how my apiary is going to look. Um, I need to go through my equipment, though, too, just because I am going to shift down to the single brood. But, I mean, it, that's really, I mean, to say single brood, you know, what I'm looking to do here very early on is I'm going to push them all down into one deep. But I'm also going to put on a honey super. So, they're really, they're going to have like a deep and a half. Um And then once those queens start laying up both boxes, I'm going to push them down into the lower deep, throw on an excluder, and stack it. So, you know, this year, if I can pull 750 to 1,000 pounds of honey, that's what I want to do. And that's my whole, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing is, you know, yes, I'm going to have to feed them a little bit more heavy than what I'm typically used to, but that's okay. Um, I, I know that ahead of time so I can be prepared for it. Um, but, you know, I want to see what I can do. I mean, I've, I've been so used to the double deeps and double deeps for so long that it's like, you know, it's just, it, it almost, to me, it almost gets boring. So I want to challenge myself a little bit. And that's what I want to do this year. Um, I've got, you know, I'm coming out of the winter with less colonies than what I would have liked. Um, I've got nine strong colonies. It is what it is, but those nine strong colonies, I can split, you know, and I can have more than 15 real quick. 
So my numbers, I think, will be about spot on where I want. I'm going to throw up a little nuke bench. That way, if anything, you know, over 15 um, happens, I'm just going to get them built up. And that's going to be that. And I'll see, you know, if any close friends want want some deals on some nukes, you know. Um, but th this year is going to be really fun just because, you know, I'm going to test myself a little bit, you know. And, and why not? You know, beekeeping every year we learn. So why not? go about managing my colonies in a way that I never have before. You know, I've got all, all the equipment, I think. Um, but one of the things this weekend, like when I go over and just prep the area, I need to get a count on boxes just because from what I've been told, um, you know, people have said, make sure you have three, if not four supers for every colony that you plan on doing that to. So I just need to make sure. I mean, I had enough before that I could throw two supers on, I think it was 23 colonies. So I've got, I should have 40 some boxes. Um, but since I'm only going with one deep, you know, I, I was saying earlier also, what would it hurt? I was talking to another buddy of mine. What would it hurt to throw a deep on top of there? If I run out of a medium, what's it hurt to throw a deep on there? won't hurt anything. It's just heavier, you know, it's more weight on the back is all. So, you know, but I, I, I just need to get a count on everything because our season is going to come on so fast that I want to make sure I have everything set and ready. And, you know, I, I think probably what I'm going to end up doing if I need anything, um, March 17th, when I'm driving home, I'll probably have some boxes in the back of my car. So coming back from somebody's place. So, but you know, it, it's going to be fun. I mean, this year's going to be fun. And if I can, if I get anywhere near close to a thousand pounds of honey over the season, uh, that'd be amazing for me, but I'll take, I mean, 750 would be good. You know, it's for, you know, I saw Stan Gore. It was, uh, he had a post on his page earlier. It's not a hobbyist because really beekeeping, it's more than a hobby. I'm a small scale beekeeper. That's what I, I like am. That. I like that. So, but no, it, it's going to be a lot of fun this year. It is. And I'm going to be home, you know, more just, you know, my contracts are going to be extended again. So that's the only thing that I was kind of worried about is, is my work going to yank me away so that I can't, you know, stay on top of them like I wanted to. But, you know, I, I'm, it's looking like I'm going to be around most of the year again. So, um, you know, it's, it's good. It's good. So I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. So I, I, and kind of in review, as far as the single deep management, I'm trying to just, I'm trying to hit comments here. So if I, if you already said this and didn't, oh. <laughs> is it mainly because of the honey production? Because you just make more honey that way. Is that kind of what your theory is? So there, why, there, why do you, why are you, I mean, what's your, yeah, I think you mentioned a little bit, but kind of going yeah. into more detail on that, Brian. So there's a couple reasons now, you know, of course, yes, if we can get colonies to produce more honey, you know, for me, um, I don't typically sell bees. I've only ever sold a couple. I enjoy that sticky mess. You know, I, I enjoy the honey. Um, yes, that type of management from what I've heard, and it's literally, it's pretty much across the board, everybody that does it they've all said, get ready because you're going to be spending honey like you never did before. Now, yes, that's, that's, you know, um, one of the advantages to it. Uh, what I'm also looking at is as far as inspections, you know, we all know, like I've said in the past, I, I dedicate each week. I say, okay, I have this amount of time that I can give to my colonies, you know, as far as beekeeping. Well, if I only have to look at one brood box, right there my yeah. inspection time goes down also when i do treatments you know a lot of treatments like when i drop strips it's you know two strips you know for every brood box well you know that adds up you know even when like last year when i was dropping strips in 21 it adds up so you know it should cut down cost on my treatments as well um we'll see so there, there's a couple reasons there you know, the cost of treatments, 
the time for inspections. I think time is probably more valuable, you know, um, than what the honey will be. You know, if I can get some time back to maybe do some other things in the apiary, that's what I'm looking at. So. Sounds good. I know that, that uh, Jason talked about, I think earlier, if I'm not mistaken, Jason from Bohemia Bees, that it, you do have to get in more often because they can, mm -hmm. they can fill that brew box out so fast and, and uh, get crammed in there. But I kind of run a little bit of everything. Um, <clears throat> uh, like, you know, if I do a split and they're in a single deep, then I'll just start stacking honey supers on that. But if I got some really big, strong, established double deeps, sometimes I go with that. And so um, I just wanted to get a little more input insight from you on that. And, and uh, I've got some big, some hives are stacked up pretty tall right now that I'm going to probably break down. And I imagine when I do that, I'll end up doing mm -hmm. some, a lot of more, maybe more singles than usual. <clears throat> I'd like to, <clears throat> Greg, we'll move on to you in a minute, but I'd like to go through, I've starred some comments here. Once again, folks, if we miss you, you know, I'm sorry. We got a lot of stuff coming. We really appreciate it, but um, let's kind of go. And Brian, I'm not sure how to, how to get them out of the uh, starred section when, after we address them, but uh, Jason careful. asked, Jason for me, how is the Beetle Sucker 5000? Is it working still? Uh, yes, it is. I did. I do need to retape the uh, tip on there. It, it kind of came loose and it worked well. Um, but, and I think that really helped me up in Ozark. It is very tedious though, and kind of slow. And so it's not something you can use on, like you can't go out and, and, and suck up beetles in, you know, 200 colonies in a day. It, it and the battery doesn't last very long. So you just got to kind of a little bit at a time and, and, uh, but it did work. It's very effective. It really you know, it gets the beetles out of there. It sucks the beetles right out of the hive. Imagine that the beetle sucker 5,000. And if you don't know what we're talking about, I, a couple of videos ago, I did a, a video on this, this, uh, this, uh, little tiny vacuum cleaner that a uh, bug farmer sent me. If you go to his, his YouTube channel is pretty cool too, but he sent it to me, just made it and sent it to me. And it's, it's, it's I think it really helped up there. Uh, Lisa Grammy midwife question for Bruce. Are the, are the temps here still too cool, still too cool for Formic pro? I think we're coming up on a good time. I think the daytime temperatures for Formic need to be, I think is Greg, is it 50 to 85? Is that correct? What's your understanding on Formic Pro? Oh, can't hear you. Yeah, I think you, I would, there are the, there the guidelines for that. And I think regionally, everyone has a slightly different range that they're most comfortable with. But I think, if you're in that range, you're you're in the ballpark, but find somebody in your local area who uses it and see what kind of, sometimes a three to a five degree difference can can, can make all the difference I, in the world. And I think it's I think it's most important from a safety standpoint, the upper temperatures, but the lower temperatures I'm sure matter as well. And Lisa, you know, you could definitely reach out to Tom, um, Formic Pro. If you have any questions about that, he could give you details. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Ginger Briner says, uh, nervous about the weather. Hope not like last year. Don't want to get hopes up yet. Yeah, last year was kind of a crazy year. It got warm really quickly. And then it just, uh, you know, and then we had a cold snap and it messed a lot of people up, especially here in the South. So, yeah, you got it. This time of the year, I think it's kind of a nationwide and maybe a worldwide thing in the springtime. The weather can be very inconsistent sometimes and it can, it can come back and bite you if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see, yeah. we've got uh, Cassinger's Acres focusing on honey, mentoring, grafting, a Great Plains Master Bee course, and oh, no nice. swarms. Those are all great goals. That's we awesome. Got Jason, I'm going to be more deliberate with colony use, honey production, nukes, queens, etc. Is typically been organized chaos. <laughs> well, Jason, I have a lot of very similar goals to that, but mine is unorganized chaos, and so you're, you're you got one up on me there. <laughs> I'm trying to become more intentional and, and more um, efficient with what I do as well. I'm going to kind of go back to the basics this year is my goal. Uh, David at Lewis Family Homestead says he wants to have 10 long laying hives and five vertical hives is his goal. Those are great goals. We got Jonas uh, here would like to have 300 colonies and produce 1,000 cuts of comb honey. That's a lofty goal, Jonas. I hope you reach that goal. And uh, there could be some really nice money involved there, too, if you can reach yeah. that goal. Wow. Utah Bee Man, a glade out there um, mm -hmm. in uh, Utah. Met him at Bee Expo. 
I'm at 36, so I'll sell 10 nukes. I want to do better equalizing everything for the honey flow. Midsummer, I'll raise the next 20 queens from nukes to overwinter. Nice. Great goals. That's really be kind of getting the hang of it out there, Glade. Hope it all works out well for you. We got, um, we got next, Linda. Linda says, how full of brood do you let the top box get before you put the queen uh, down and add the excluder? Thank you. Um, that is a, that is something that happens. The system that I use, and Greg, Brian, you guys feel free to chime in here. It's really a good question because when you, if you put an extra box on, what I like to do is add my honey supers, let the bees work them for a little while before I put the queen excluder in. That way, I seem to have better success with the bees going up in the top of the hive and actually putting honey in there instead of staying below the queen excluder. However, Linda has a good point here, especially if it's new comb you're putting in, like new foundation. That queen loves to lay in that brand new drawn out comb. And so I guess the question is how full of brew do you let it get before you put that queen excluder down um, or put the queen excluder in there. And once they're working that comb really good, Linda, if there's a good flow going, I'll go ahead and slap that thing in there pretty quickly. It needs to be at least uh, three weeks before. If, you, if you're not worried about their bringing some brooding or honeycomb there, which I don't worry about that too much, it needs to be at least three weeks before you harvest um, because then those that that brood will emerge and they can they'll they'll fill that up with nectar and honey after that brood emerges do you guys have any thoughts on that greg or brian go ahead brian you're the single brood I've, man this year i've so what i've read and what i've been told is once you have a couple frames so you get two frames three frames the basics of it is and the whole concept and and now little disclaimer there i am no expert at this this is going to be my first year um, trying it. However, I've done a lot of reading and, you know, I've, I've looked up a lot of information on it. You basically want, even if it's two to three frames of brood, you want them to be going up and working it. And that's mm -hmm. the whole purpose of what people said. You want the bees to go up. So when you push the queen back down, your bees are already going to be up there working that. That brood hatches out what are they going to do exactly what Bruce said is they're going to fill it back up with nectar. So that's the whole reasoning of what people told me. They said, you know, get them working them boxes, you know, and it's not going to hurt to have a little bit of brood. It's going to emerge out. You're good. So, but from what I've heard two or three is, is about where you want, but you know, that's staying on top of it. So yeah. We'll for see. sure. When, we'll see. The, the idea is to have the bees up there working it. Once they're willing to go through that queen excluder and they're up there working it, then they'll do it. But you just got to get them up there. And, and, you know, if you slap a box of empty of uh, just basic foundation on top of a queen excluder yeah. and you, you want them to come up there and work it, some bees just are hesitant to do that. So you want them up there working it and feeling comfortable uh, before you do that. Greg, what are your thoughts on that? Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll be a little contrary. Um, a lot of this depends on your configuration if you're if you are talking about running doubles that's going to look a little different than if you're um running a single brood management just to to, to quickly uh, to it's hard to cruise through that that answer but the basics are i don't let i don't i don't like i don't want any brood above an excluder i want zero and but if it happens um i would prefer it to be sealed brood where i have sealed brood hatching out and bees coming up to tend to that, and then there there is no um, effect. However, I'm, I'm I primarily yes, I, I love story and a halves, but I personally prefer doubles for a lot of um, reasons because we can make a lot more bees and utilize that. There's there's this thing where the overall work the overall workforce has a let's say a its greatest potential is when it reaches a certain size. And once it reaches a certain size, that exponential uh, asset it can create is a little different than if you keep them crunched down into one box prematurely. I think what Brian's talking about doing is he's not gonna just be raising the bees in the single box and then throwing a super on there. He's gonna be raising them coming out of the wintertime in doubles where you've got two boxes full He's likely going to shake all the bees off of, or most of the bees off of those frames into the bottom box. Mm -hmm. And he's going to add a box on top for them to draw out, or he's going to put drawn comb in there with an excluder. 
So the bees have no choice to go up and store in that top box, but you're using two boxes worth of population to do it. So the question, Linda, how full of brood do you let the top box get before you put the queen down and add the excluder? If you are talking about raising bees in doubles and you're starting with a super above that, that you're dedicating for honey, I don't let any brood get on top because for the most part, I like to keep these queens to where that upper band of that second box is honey. The bees are already leaning towards going honey above. Um, so I let them go up and draw that out. And once they start drawing it out, I'll shake everybody down, put the excluder on, and then leave the box of drawn comb there and let them keep filling it out. There are so many tricks, though, where if you were in a single box scenario, um, that you're at first you're limited, but if you start up with two boxes, you've got so much flexibility in moving brood frames and food frames around to kind of um, tell them which direction you would like them to go. Of course, they still find a way to humble you and say, "No, we're going to do this and we're going to do that." But um, I try not, to, I try not to let any brood um, above the excluder, especially eggs. If I can prevent eggs from going above an excluder, because that can cause you all kind of pain and aggravation. Um, if you get any eggs above an excluder and they've got a honey band below the excluder and mama's down below and some eggs get on top, typically what you're going to find is a virgin running around there. And if that virgin hatches and she can slip through the excluder and get down into the bottom box, you talk about weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is a classic scenario every single year where that happens. And folks are saying, I had a strong hive. They swarmed. There wasn't, there wasn't a queen cell to be found below the excluder. Well, what'd you find above the excluder? And they said, well, you know, funny that you asked. It looked like there might've been a queen up there. I don't know how she got there. How did I have... So anyways, that's a long answer. It's that a is, really it's a great is, question, Linda. And that's a, that an entire, entire episode of uh, coming through yeah, that. I th yeah, I think the, uh, the, the, the trick is getting the bees up to work the... Especially, I would say, for a new beekeeper that just has foundation, getting those bees up there to work that comb. <clears throat> you know, if you want to make honey, if you want to draw comb out. And so... Those are some tricks of the trade. Um, I've got a lot of drawn comb, and so yeah, she doesn't tend to move up. And when that honey flow starts, you know, they'll start putting the honey up top and then moving the brood chamber back down kind of naturally on their own. And, Greg, if that's the case, then what you said works really well. I just like to get my bees up there working above above the brood before I put that queen excluder on because – and then I also will have an upper entrance. I've found, you know, there's three or four people um, – that uh, Randall Carter, I think Gus Mitchell does this as well as a local uh, commercial beekeeper here in Alabama. Instead, they'll have an upper entrance where they just kind of shift the top honey box forward enough, probably a quarter inch where the bees can get in and out, almost like an upper entrance. And the bees seem to be willing to, to uh, come up and uh, place honey in the upper box with that upper crack they don't always use it as an entrance for per se maybe it's the ventilation i'm not sure but you'll see bees hanging out guarding that and they really like that and so that's a little trick that i use with my honey too and i'm sure i'll be showing people that i in my previous videos from the past couple of years but i'll show them i'm sure again this year uh great question though stan gore a comment here from stan he says glad to see all the small scale beekeepers on here and that's true we got a lot of people of all different sizes on here and we appreciate you guys being here uh VIA honeybees, our main focus is going to be queens, UBO testing, floating mating yards as much as possible, with drone genetics we like, and grafting. And uh, nice. I'm just going to whip through some comments here real quick. I've kind of gotten behind on the comments, guys. So if we don't get you, I apologize. CCB lady is going to graft and sell queens and nukes. Plan on bringing some special genetics from a few different queen breeders for better control of varroa mites. I like where everybody's minds are. People really make have yeah. some great goals. Um, what do you guys think of the double deep frames for the brood box? I know it's not a new concept. I've seen a little bit about this. All it's almost like the uh, is, are they talking about like a lens type frame or where people will Vino. attach two frames together, you know, like Vino that kind of thing. I think it makes sense, but I don't know how practical it is in my case or for the average beekeeper, especially if you're trying to grow. I think it's a cool concept and it makes sense to me. Like if you can figure out the ultimate size of space for your brood chamber, mm -hmm. lands might be a good size for that, but yeah. it's just not practical for what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm kind of in a, <laughs> I kind of have to go with what's available out there and there's no way I could build 
you know, 200 of those colonies. It just doesn't work for me. It would be kind of fun to play around with, but I've decided to kind of get back to basics this year more than anything else. Yeah. <clears throat> you guys got any comments on that or? No, I, I know Jim at Vino Vino Farms. He he has those larger frames, and then Bug Farmer he built some also. They seem to really lay those things up. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's just you can't go to a store and buy those things. Yeah, you have to be them, so you have to be a craftsman. You know, yeah. you've got to have a wood shop to be able to make some of those things, and that's just not for everybody. Well, I think yeah. these those type of things are. We always got to be open-minded to the thing that we are not interested in because there is always something to learn from it. There's an opportunity. Yeah. <clears throat> but the double length frames are not exactly practical at a certain scale. They are interesting and they're, it's a great learning opportunity if you, if you put that into a specific scale for a specific reason. Um, but... From the practical standpoint, if you're running X amount of colonies and your goal is X amount of colonies and getting through, I think it's cool to have unique things to learn from because it gives us a different look and a different lens to see the bees through. So I, I, I wouldn't discount anything, but I would just say from a practical standpoint, double deep frames would be um, challenging. I mean, think about though, think about, I mean, you guys know how heavy a deep frame that is a full slab of brood is. I mean, you're talking about having, you got to have a, a pretty significant frame and foundation if you pull those rascals. I mean, you're talking. Yeah. So it, I think it's, I think it's, and the bees will do any, I mean, if you guys have seen bee, bees will draw a six foot piece of comb inside of a wall if they can, you know, an un, uninterrupted continuous piece of yeah. comb. The bees love it, but how practical right. is it as a beekeeper is the question. Yeah. Um, Lauren Hall, you, we were at 10 now, 12 aiming for 20 this year and honey production is at the top of that list. Good goals. Nice. Um, let's see. Nathaniel Hampton here has, uh, approximately 20 hives at the peak of summer and have lost all but six. Should I buy Queens and make splits or invest in nukes? Hobbyist only all Queens were two to three years old or late swarms that died. Mm. Greg, I'm going to let you field this question. So let me, let what me cruise that one more time. I had, uh, 20 around 20 highs or so at the peak of summer uh, and have lost all but six should i buy queens and make splits or invest in nukes hobbyist only all queens were two to three years old or late swarms that had died there's a that's a at first that's a lot of information there so thanks there's a there's a lot to sort through there but having 20 hives at the peak of summer definitely um, is different than having 20 hives after your first uh, heavy dearth and so what were the strengths of those colonies how big were they what kind of health were, were they in uh, at queens two to three years old i mean we've had queens live five years but it doesn't mean that they had the, the last couple of years were a very productive season for them um, so the question is you know what what should i do here should i buy queens and make splits or invest in nukes this is really tricky. I'm going to try to give a short answer because I need to have a more thorough episode where we kind of dig into some of these things. Um, it comes down to, to Nathaniel, what are your goals? If your goals are reaching a certain number of colonies because you have um, a certain goal as far as production goes, this conversation goes a bunch of different ways. And one of the, mo one of the greatest ways, like if your goal is to get to, um, if you want to have an extra 10 or 12 colonies producing honey this year. What I'm getting ready to say is extremely contrary, but I'll say it's backed up by years and years of experience, not just by me, but folks who put this into practice, what they find. But if your goal is to make honey and you see that you're shy on the number of colonies to do it, you will be absolutely surprised what a package of bees can do early in the season. So many times those rascals will produce at least one super for you, still build up, produce at least a super in the fall and have more than what they need to go into the winter time if managed correctly. So if your goal is number of hives and honey production, you might skip nukes altogether and go to packages. If you're looking for genetic drones and specific genetic diversity, that's where nukes shine, especially if you're getting them from a reputable supplier 
with known genetics. If folks were coming to us and they specifically want our Caucasian and Carniolan genetics, we saw them nukes, we saw them our queens. If folks are wanting an early start in packages for dead outs, if they're wanting packages to grow their out yards for honey, then we, we steer them towards packages. I don't know, I don't think, I'm a guy who is guilty of spreading everything way too thin. What I probably would not do, if you're down to six hives right now, you know, let's say you have at least four coming out of the, coming out of the spring, I would not sacrifice those four to make splits quite yet. What I would do is grow them out. I would requeen them, however, especially if those queens are already several or two or three years old, I would requeen all those completely. Um, but if you're looking at growing, you might think about packages to get an early jump. If you want genetics, go to nukes. Okay. That's a great answer. And, and uh, I think you're right about that, Greg. If you want to grow, you need to bring some a new stuff into your operation, especially if you want to make honey, I would say. Um, real quick, uh, once again, Greg, uh, thanks for the uh, super chat. Uh, Brian as well means a lot. And then Queen Right Dial, thanks so much for the $10 super chat. Appreciate you guys. And uh, wow, what great questions. I'm going to tell everybody, I just, I just messaged Brian. I am 148 comments behind. <laughs> so I've been like trying to answer these questions to go through. I can't handle five things at once like Brian can. So um, if I don't post your comment or start your comment or your question, please forgive me. We've, they've been rolling in very quickly tonight, and we certainly yeah. appreciate that. Um, I would like to... Uh, go to a question from David's Bee Farm. I think this might be David. Oh, it is. That's uh, his picture is a picture of me, and he's the guy I went over to Bay Manette over by Mobile and bought a bunch of boxes from. That is his. I believe it's his uncle, if I'm not mistaken, in the picture with us. So if you can see on there a little bit, but I, just, I went and got those boxes from his uncle. Was a commercial beekeeper and was selling, kind of selling out. He had some health issues, and Dave has become a pretty good friend. He we comment back and forth quite a bit. But he says, um, "Have you started? Have you started or about to start your grafting adventure? I have not done that yet because I got those queens. I needed to make splits this past weekend, and the weather has been a little inconsistent." I think I might wait until after. I'm not sure if I'm going to do it. I need to do it pretty quickly or wait until after the Wisconsin conference because then I know we'll be in spring. I know it'll be a, you know, it'll be a lot safer to do it then, especially for my first time doing it in a long time. I've only tried to graft, I think, one other time, and it was very, very minimal success. And it just, it's just been, it's easy, been easier to buy cells and buy queens, but I want to, I want to figure out how to do it. And so... I do have some queens I think identified if you saw my most recent video that's, that's uploaded. And uh, I'm going to kind of probably lean on you, Greg, a little bit and others to kind of get some guidance on that. But to answer your question, David, is I will we'll probably wait until after that Wisconsin conference, middle of March, or I may just decide to do it here in the next week or two, but I kind of doubt that. But we'll see. I'll keep you posted on the channel. Um, DC's bees, it's a pretty good question. You know, buying a package would be like getting a swarm, wouldn't it? What do you think about that, Greg? Is that, it's a little different. It's it's it's, um, it's a lot different, and well, it, yes and no. It's it's similar in that you have bulk bees that are not on a frame format, so it's very similar to that. The main difference is uh, with a swarm, you're getting a potentially last year or the year before its queen who is swarming for the most part. If you're getting a late season swarm, of course, you could have a, like for this year, for instance, you could have a, uh, let's say we had a requeening event. Uh, let's say we're making, we're making up our nukes and we're dropping cells and we've got queens hatching and this nuke grows and for whatever reason we don't sell it and it grows big, 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 big. And we get into like August, September and they're just going gangbusters. They put on a swarm cell. They swarm out late. That queen could be a this year queen and that could be. Uh, that could that could be a really nice swarm. Um, when you get into other swarm situations, like a lot of the swarms that I see, is I'm not typically seeing young queens at all in swarms. I'm seeing much older um, queens. So what does that mean? Well, that means you've got potentially an unknown age of a queen who has an unknown uh, longevity or lifespan ahead uh, that she could have left where she came from for a couple of different reasons. Either the colony was so healthy and so productive they had no more room so that they swarm and did what they did. 
but you never know if a swarm is a swarm or really an, an, an abscond. You have no really way of knowing. And I have seen it go both ways. I have seen some very healthy swarms with old queens. I've also seen some very unhealthy swarms that were absolutely riddled with the form wing virus with mites all over them, that those would be the last things that I would want to invest in and put in my equipment and try to keep going. When we have seen that, you almost have to, just like if you had a swimming pool, you have to shock the colony, throw so much treatment at them to get them clean. Otherwise, they just continue to struggle. A lot of times, those are they are absconding because of mite or pest pressure or lots of other things. So just because it is a, a, a bulk amount of bees hanging uh, from a fence post with a queen, is that an asset or is that a liability? I, it, it is my personal opinion that it could go either way. Um, and depending on what your goals are in your bee yard, for me, those are more of a liability than an asset because it's an unknown origin, unknown genetic, unknown health. And I don't want to bring too many unknown factors into our breeding program, to our out yards and things of that nature. So is it bu buying a package would be like a swarm, wouldn't it? It absolutely, for the, for the most part, would be in the mechanism of which the bees get restarted, how you rehome them and get them established for the most part. So it would, however, packages are typically available well in advance of swarm season, um, at least in our neck of the woods, we're very clear about this. We provide package bees for folks who need bees early in the year. So early that we are not, it, it is too cool for us to even start grafting. So those bees have to come from the south to bring them up to provide that opportunity for folks who want to get their bees started early. Uh, or that's on time if you want to, to capitalize on something like a locust flow. So DC's bees, that's a, absolutely, that's a great question. And again, that is one of those where we could, we could break that down into all the components. And that's an hour and a half long talk. You guys are taking notes. <clears throat> Brian, you're taking notes of some of these questions so we can go deeper in future. You guys are giving us great ideas for titles for future videos here. This is recorded. Um, I want to, uh, yeah, I want to um, put a shout out to uh, Charlie and Paige uh, Gothard. And that's how you say their last name. Alhambra Honeybees, I think is the name of their channel. Um, they sent me a little something. They were on here a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about products in the hive. I got some soap right here from them. Looks like Brian got the same thing. And I guess this is some lotion, a lotion bar, maybe. It's really good. Smells great. And I just appreciate okay. that, uh, Charlie Even. and Paige. I thank you guys for sending that to me. And Greg, I, did you hear from them as well? I think you did. Yeah, you? they were. we were excited. We received a, uh, a, a beautiful wow. care package of Scion wood. So we're looking forward to uh, grafting that onto apples and keeping awesome. those uh, genetics uh perpetually for the future of the next generation. So big shout out to Charlie Gothard, Alhambra, uh, Apiary and Orchard. Thank you for sending that scion wood. We're looking forward to getting those grafted. Well, what definition of scion wood, what is that? Is that uh, buds that are ready for grafting? Is that what that means? Well, like if you look at this tree behind us here, like uh, you can, you, you have the root stock, which compromises what the roots are of the tree. It tells the tree the size, the shape, disease resistance, things of that nature. But if you look at like these little branches up here, this being an apple tree, scion wood is the cuttings of last year's growth where the apples were, and that dictates the variety of apples. So you could have a standard apple tree that can grow 60 to 70 feet, but it have a grime, a green grimes or a yellow delicious or a, or a pippin, different varieties of apples. The cool thing, um, stay tuned for some videos this year, we have some Antonovka apples, the rootstock, which are standard old Russian standards, which can bear fruit for up to 150 years. Wow. What we're going to do is graft many different varieties onto the same tree like we've done in the past. So we'll have a Frankenstein tree that can have two, three, four, 12 different varieties blooming at all slightly different times and potentially cross pollinating themselves all from the same rootstock. And the cool thing is, a society grows great when old men plant trees under the shade they know they'll never sit under. You talk about the scriptural proverbs of a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. That's cool. To be able to, to grasp and have fruit for your grandchildren, that's cool. 
That is neat. Okay. Don't get me started on Scion Wood. Uh, yeah. Here. Come on now. Listen, we talked about how long we wanted to go tonight before we started, and we are just. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't even gotten into that. We have, we're just uh, we haven't even hardly uh, started, and I am now. Yeah. I'm 220 comments behind, and so um, yeah, Yappy Yappy says we wanted to. His goal is to drive Greg Burns crazy. Well, Yappy, you're probably not too far from doing that. So keep up the good work. <laughs> keep up the good work. You're well like you get close. I, I appreciate Yappy. I just want to. Well, well, let's talk about. Well, let me go back. I'm gonna. We'll come back to uh, Rainier. Yappy, guys, for those of you who have seen his channel, you know. He comes on the channel. He, he produces great content, and he is just hilarious. And he's high energy, but he is just a good what? dude. Yappy, he will. Um, he'll help. He helps. He's helped me out multiple times on the phone. Yeah. He's giving me suggestions for video thumbnails, titles. Many, uh, a few of the titles and thumbnails that you see on my on my videos were. He had a big influence on on the, some of those things because I I, I care about it. I, I appreciate his input. So he's just a good dude. You know, he's he is hilarious. He's a wild, crazy man, but he is just a good man. Um, uh, Rainier, Reindeer's Bees. I have 18 colonies currently. I want 28 hives and 12 nukes by the end of the year. I want to harvest 300 to 500 pounds of honey this year. Uh, for those who don't know, a Rainier at Reindeer's Bees, he is a young man who was in the youth program. And this year, I think he helped with the Bee Expo up there, helped with the, uh, helped work at the Bee Expo, if I'm not mistaken. Great kid. He's up in Maine, if I'm not mistaken. And, and it's a whole different ball game up there with the weather. Um, but he's just, he's making things happen. And so thanks for checking in tonight, Rainier. Um, spell his name just like Mount Rainier in Washington State. Um, Rainier. I think he already had the form. I was quickly just grabbing the calculator and doing the basic math there. But it looks like hes he already has what he needs to, to do that. It looks like that he only needs 10 colonies to produce the honey. He's got yeah. eight extra to split and make some nukes. So hes he's already ready to rock and roll coming out of the spring. He's got it dialed in, it sounds like. Yeah, um, let's go back up and talk about uh, Cassinger's Acres. Has a really good question here that applies to anyone who's a beekeeper. Can we talk comb production? And I assume what he means here is how do you build comb? How do you build up comb, you know, um, on foundation? Uh, you know, obviously there's comb honey as well, and that's a whole different conversation. But what are some techniques, some, some, uh, some, some methods of building drawing out comb because comb as we know is gold in the beekeeping world uh, if you want to produce honey if you want to quickly produce bees if you already have that comb available the bees don't have to rebuild that comb or build that comb out to start off with so greg if you if you want to if you wanted to expand or if you or if you were a new beekeeper and you wanted to build comb for the future what would you say would be the most efficient way to do that feed 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 that simple Feed them to stimulate the wax. Give them the carbohydrates that they need to do. See right there. Keith, Keith nailed it. It is that simple. Feed, feed, feed. And what I go. found, which, again, is contrary, we feed nothing. We don't thin our feed. We don't even talk about a one-to-one. -one. We feed a straight. It's probably a th between a three and a four-to-one pro, pro sweet straight all year uh, on the colonies that were, you know, ent enticing brood and getting – them to draw comb that's the big thing that they need it's a long that's a that's a deep dive into the uh, biology of the honeybee but in short we need carbohydrates for those bees to stimulate the wax glands to stimulate that wax production and that is the best way to do it is to lay the feed to them and I'm, i'll also add that liquid feed is the in my opinion the uh, the most important thing but a lot of thing that's actually underrated uh, and I think underutilized is, is to give them just enough supplemental protein as well to where that need is met. Just enough to where it, I feel like at least that liquid feed is more available for them to send to the function to create wax from the wax glands. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the best way to do it. And, I, and on a, obviously on a good flow in the spring, they just, they don't care. You can't slow them down. But it, it, when you're not on a good flow, and sometimes even when you are, that feed can really help. So, um, man, we just got, I've got, to, I've got to check into the live comments. So I've, this I've is got to be a great I'm, year. This is going to be one of the best, uh, stream team beekeeping chat years because the, our audience is maturing, we're maturing and there's always a fresh rounds of brood per se coming into the conversation. And so there's always a little bit different look at some of the same questions we've talked about every single year. And that's pretty exciting. 
Hey, I wanted to bring up a question here. I just checked into the most recent comments and this one popped up. Gary Stewart, if I get a swarm keeping them undrawn foundation as they draw them out, they will just keep on drawing. And that's been my, you know, I think kind of going back to that swarm question earlier with the, the packages and swarms, you know, a lot of my operation has been, has been established using swarms. And, and like you said, Greg, you never know what you're getting with a swarm. You can get a, a swarm that will be just a, just die out quickly. But one thing that, that is pretty darn common with swarms is they are motivated. They get in a, they get in a box, they will draw that stuff out so fast. You can't hardly stay ahead of them initially. But what I've seen, it seems like over the years is they will very quickly, much of the time, especially the early prime swarms, you know, that queen is usually older and they will supersede that queen pretty quickly has been my experience. Um, but it is, it is important. Whenever I catch a swarm, I don't count that. I mean, to me, until they've proven themselves over a period of time, I don't, you know, it's really not, really not part of my operation because that way I'm not disappointed when that little swarm peters out or dies out or they're not healthy bees and I got to get rid of them type of a thing, you know. So I don't spend a lot of time going out and trying to catch swarms now. I used to just do it. If I got a swarm call, man, I was going to do whatever I could to get that swarm now. I don't do that. Um, but, but if I happen to catch some, I just, you know, I kind of just watch them and just set them off to the side and if kind of, if they make it on their own, they do, if they don't, then they don't, you can feed them if you want to. But typically what I've found this time of the year, if they're starting to swarm in the spring, there's usually some stuff coming in for them. And, and many times they'll figure it out, unless like you said, Greg, it's like an abscon later in the year or certain times of the year, then they sometimes, I think sometimes they may almost do an off put almost like a relief of the colony. Some of the bees will leave to, to help the give the colony a chance to survive better i'm not sure why they do that but that's a great question and they will they are we just know that we know that swarms especially healthy swarms are motivated if nothing else they're motivated and um you know you can watch them if that queen kind of fizzles out or if if you know they replace or you don't like the genetics you can always replace them but but uh those are some thoughts i have on swarms gosh man i'm so far behind on everything so if we've missed your questions i uh, uh, i apologize david lewis um thanks for the super chat hey you say small contribution any contribution is largely appreciated i really appreciate you man you're on here consistently and we really do appreciate that Ooh, brian you got anything else anything else star that we need to check into yeah, right there tennessee tim got good news I got good news today. First time being asked to speak at other bee clubs. God is good. That's Greg, awesome. Tell us, tell us a little bit about Tennessee Tim for those who may not know who he is. Boy, I think you know him. I think you know I, him. It's hard to, to sum Tennessee Tim up, but I'll I'll say this is one of the one of the greatest things about beekeeping is uh, the people that God brings into your life through beekeeping. Uh, and it was uh, one, of, one of our greatest moments that I think I'll always look back uh, in our beekeeping journey is uh, blessed with the opportunity to meet Tim McCandless and to hear his story and to learn of his, his, his you talk about tenacity. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to say something that's, that's extremely bold, but we've heard the word tenacity used by some very respected people. Um, and I think tenacity um, is, isn't something that you judge the tenaciousness of each individual person's tenacity. But I have never known uh, someone to have the amount of drive and tenacity as I have with, with Tennessee Tim McCandless for that full story. Not right now, uh, maybe a little bit later on tonight or tomorrow or whenever you're seeing this. I would encourage you to go to our the, the Nature's Image Farm YouTube channel. And there's two interviews with Tim McCandless. Um, in short, you talk about a guy who was on his deathbed and his death wish crying out to God is God, give me the strength to get out of this bed in, in nearly a dying breath. Lord, give me the strength. Give me my next breath and my next minute, my next hour, my next day, my next footstep to work these bees and I will serve you doing it. And here he is years later. Uh, a completely different guy uh, with, and God gave him a second chance at life through beekeeping. Uh, he's, he is a, a huge inspiration to so many folks. It is absolutely an honor to call Tim a friend. Um, that's the short speech. There's a much longer one, but uh, we really appreciate Tim 
his family, but more importantly, his testimony. And that has uh, been such a huge witness to us and so many folks. Greg, can I take a minute and piggyback on that a little bit sure. about the concept, the principle you just taught there? You know, I've, I think it's human nature to, to when we're in a difficult time when we're struggling to, to lean on God, to lean on our faith. And, but I think when we begin to have success, many times we begin to take credit for that success. And, uh, I think Tim is a great example and I hope, you know, I'm learning to be a, a better person in this respect in that if you ask for something from the, from the Lord and, and you, you get that blessing then, and you begin to have success, continue to give him the credit, Absolutely. continue to ask him what, what he wants you to do. And I think he can take you to places you've never even imagined. And, you know, I know, I hope, you know, we do, we've been known on this chat to talk about things like that occasionally. I hope it's okay with the folks in the chat section here, but, uh, it just, it means a lot to, to know Tim and people that have the faith that he has and so many folks on here know Stan and gosh, I can't even begin to, you know, I know probably a majority of the folks, if not everybody in this, in this chat here has their own story when it comes to that, but that's how you can truly be the most successful is if you just turn it over to, to him and, and he'll guide you. It's hard to do, especially if you're successful, it's hard to do that. And sometimes you wonder about that, but, but as long as you strive to do that, you know, you're going to be okay. You just got to remember that. So just wanted to bring that in there. Um, man, it's just so much fun. I just, <laughs> sometimes just to be honest on days of stream teams, I don't know. I don't really get nervous anymore, but I'm kind of like, man, I'm tired, but I always get so energized when I'm on these chats. It's so cool. Bruce, we might um, have to think about our, our format a little bit. We may have to um, consider, you know, on a rotation, it just a Q and a show where we just rapid fire through questions and try to get through as many i mean there that, that that's always an, a possibility um with all the things that's, that we do there's something that's kind of kind of kind of what this turned into tonight and i just don't there's just no way we can address every comment and question yeah. but i also wanted to go in here and, and once again we talked to david thanks for the super chat um ripple effect thanks so much for the super chat uh kenneth bach we got ten dollars thank you so much and ed Ed lives close to me right here, probably, what, five, ten minutes away from me here, just, just down the road in Napierfield, Midland City area. Uh, thanks, uh, Ed, for that uh, super sticker. Wow. Got to catch my breath here a minute. Brian, why don't you pitch in a little bit here? Chime in, and what do you got for us? I don't have anything. <laughs> Not true. You have a lot to offer. I don't have anything. I've, I've been just going through here, starring questions. Not it's this is crazy tonight. It's been so much fun. We're man. gonna. We've, this is gonna so turn just, into just some phenomenal questions too. I mean, these are all great questions. Um, this is gonna turn into one of those. Um, I, I think we're gonna go for what the longest stream on record. No, I, I don't think so. <laughs> all right, uh, Central Kentucky Bees question. I'm gonna try the green drone frames this year. What's the best way to apply them to my hives? Running mostly double deeps, install them in the top or the bottom. They are new and need to be drawn. Never used them. All right, Greg, that's a question for you then. The answer is yes. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, you know, think about, uh, I like to, rather than think about when is the, when should I do something or how I do something, I like to, to look into why. So if we're using, um, if you use the green frames and the bees aren't in a mind to put drones on, they'll end up using it for honey. Uh, but if you can look at the colony and say, are they leaning towards drones? We get that comb in there ahead of time where they actually draw it out. And then we put that into the part of the colony where they typically wear, would put drones. For me personally, I let that colony get so mature and jamming that they're actually ready in their journey to put drones on. And we've got those green frames. Sometimes they're just always there on the outside edge. And as that colony grows into that frame, it's there and it's ready. Nine times out of 10, even in a 10 frame single box, by the time they get to that outside edge, even if you don't manipulate it and move it in, they're ready to start working with drones. And so they start on that frame. Sometimes a colony doesn't want anything to do with drones in the bottom box and it only wants to be in the top box. Some colonies, if you give them four sheets of drone frames, they won't touch it and they'll put drone comb in between the two boxes. So it all depends, but I like to make sure, I usually lean on just having the green frames in there um, just ahead of time. 
so they can draw it out and then I leave it in the box the rest of the season. Um, I like to take advantage of it. It depends on what your goals are. If you are in a situation where you are asset rich when it comes to drawn comb, then I think you can go ahead and put those green frames in much sooner. If you're drawn comb poor and you need them to draw as much comb as you can, then what I would do is let them focus on drawing your standard sheets of foundation out first, checkerboarding, moving those in, moving your you know pollen bound frames or honey frames to the outside of the box, putting the new frames in. Once they get a grip on that, then you can start pulling the honey up and then start putting those green drone frames down on the outside edge of the brood frame. If you think about what's going to happen with, with that frame is mama's got to go in there and start laying the eggs to be the future drones. So if they're only interested in putting honey up top, or even, even if it's a double deep and they're only putting honey up there and she doesn't want to go up, it's going to be a wasted effort to put the green frame up there where they have no intention on putting brood. But if you put that down low or you put that where the brood nest is, most of the time they will use that uh, the larger cell of the green frame to do just that. And you will find them will go to town using that for drones. How to use that, how to leverage green frames in your apiary or your small queen breeding program. That's a whole other conversation for a different day. But I, I do, I am a big fan of the green frames. Yeah, one, a couple of little strategies here, and, and I've got some green frames. I need to stick some of those in my colonies. I just have never have. But I believe, uh, Stan, uh, if I'm wrong on this, you can correct us in the comments. But I believe that there's a couple of really neat ways, if you, if you want to create more drones, that you can do that. Number one, um, many times if bees, if there's extra space in the colony, they will draw out drone, a drone comb. Like, for example, if you put a medium frame in a deep box, Many times that comb they draw on the bottom of that medium frame will be drone comb. Another method that Stan Gore, I believe I got this idea from him and my, actually the guy I do honey with, Rusty Norris um, in, in Hartford, he uses this technique. That's how he does his uh, comb honey. But another thing that's good for his drone comb is if you take a, take a sheet of foundation, plastic foundation, premier, whatever type of foundation you use, and uh, you just have a typical wooden frame and you cut that thing in half, you put it right in the middle of that frame, you know, the bees will draw that out normally, and then on the outside, they'll put drone comb. If it's up in the honey super, they'll make honey out of that, and then you can cut it out as comb honey. And that is really a neat way to utilize those frames. And, and my buddy Rusty, the main reason he uses them for, is for comb honey. And, man, it's beautiful. He just, the bees draw it out. They put regular honey in the, in the center section, the center third or whatever that is, center half. And on the outside, it's just beautiful comb honey. Cuts it out, sticks it in the containers, and sells it that way. And so that's the way you can do that as well. But but that if you need more drones and you don't want to buy the green frames, you don't have those, uh, you can do that. Yeah, Stan Gore says in thirds, and you can do it in thirds as well. I, I thought Rusty did it in half, but it may have been thirds. I think it is actually because there is an, about an equal distance. I'd have to look at them closer. But either way, the principle is that they'll have space on the side to put drone comb in there. And for some reason, it seems like if they need drones – They'll draw a drone comb in that empty space. They really like to do that. So, and if you don't, a couple need, of there. You don't need drones, but you want to, I think, trap mites. And I think one of the great things is to just, like you said, drop a medium frame in there, and you'd be surprised how many times it's nothing but drones. That's right. Oh, yeah. You can just cut that rascal off the bottom and uh, get rid of it. But if you're looking mm -hmm. to spread drones out through your yard, you just can't beat a green frame for just the dimensional stability of the frame but you can go through and just start pulling 10, 12, or 20 of those, throw them in the nuke boxes, throw them on the truck, run down the next yard, and just pop in just to help yeah, for sure. provide some, some drone diversity. So lots of different approaches. Some there different sure. ideas, that's for sure. And I do have some of those green frames. I need to need to put them in my better hives. I haven't done that. I haven't. I kind of, they're in a different part of the farm. I kind of forget about them, <laughs> and then it's too late. So, all right. Um, man, fun times. All right, Greg. Great. Yeah, there it is. Great question. What is your favorite grafting tool and how many different ones have you tried? I hate to say I've tried them all, but um, I have experimented with just about everything. Uh, the ones that I have a significant or speakable amount of experience is, would be um, the master grafting tool, the German grafting tools, so some of the, the several different varieties of the Germans. Uh, of course, the Chinese grafting tool. Um, 
those would be the th mostly the three that I've had the most amount of experience with. Um, and there's some really exciting news coming. I can't quite share it yet. Um, but I just the the talk I just gave in Missouri on queen rearing. One of the most embarrassing things is announcing what my favorite grafting tool is. And I'm embarrassed to announce it to say it here too. But guys, since it's just like us three, I'll just I'll say this. Yes. My favorite the Chinese grafting tool. It's 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 uniform and consistent. Once you find the one in twenty that is uniform and consistent, that rascal can do thousands of graphs. But unfortunately, the good Oh my gosh! This is this is a is this an oxymoron? The good Chinese one, the good the good Chinese <laughs> ones are usually five to seven bucks a piece, and you need ten or twenty of them to find one that is consistent. So now you're talking about you're somewhere in the twenty to sixty dollar range to find the one that works. When you find the one that works, it's a sewing needle, and you are doop doop, and you're going quick. So here's a question: Someone needs to invent an American Chinese grafting tool that actually is consistent. Maybe somebody is. Oh. Okay. Are we going to see uh, this? This is a question. <laughs> uh, let me hear. Let me highlight it. There we go. It's highlighted. Uh, question for Bruce Jenny. Uh, right. What What are your plans here this year? As far as are Are you hey. grafting this year? Is it? Okay. Yeah, I'm planning on it. That's yeah. my plan. When. Yeah, uh, this is just Brian's curiosity here. Yeah, in the next, probably after the Wisconsin conference, okay. I'm gonna because I by then I think it will be far enough into spring, and I mean I just I just it's gonna be hard to get that all figured out and done before then because we're yeah what three weeks away from that, and I'm still just trying to suck wind and stay ahead of my bees right now. So trying to actually make queens right now, I just don't think I'm quite ready to do that. I want to get these new queens I got on these hives, see what I end up with there. There. And uh <laughs> yeah, okay. Thanks, Brian. Official. <laughs> so that's kind of my goal. Probably after the Wisconsin conference. March late March, April okay. here is just prime time to graft and and you know the weather's gonna be more consistent then and we're gonna have consistent, you know, we're gonna have days when queens and drones and everybody can be flying and being happy out there and you know i'm willing to if i need to make some space before then i might just get some cells we got some really good queen cell producers around here um but i i don't know what i'm going to do with that but i i do plan on grafting and making some queens this year i'm going to try the the uh easy is it the easy peasy a queen rearing system that i purchased at the conference and just see how that works and then we'll go from there i'm it's, i don't expect great results the first time, um, if I get, I don't know what my percentage will be. I just, I'm having very low expectations. So if it's higher, I can be really excited about it because I'm the type that tends to go into things with real high expectations and get disappointed. So I'm trying to keep my expectations low so then I can be better than, than, I, than I think I'm going to be probably. Yeah, but <clears throat> even, even <throat> if, you know, say you do 10 and you get one, that's one more than what you had. I got I certainly, I, I certainly hope I get more than one, but yeah. Right. Yes. Look, guys, you guys know my train of thought, so I don't need to go down this rabbit hole because I've got a whole talk on this, but leave it to beekeepers to spend $10 on a $1 part just for the experience. And if it's for the that's, experience, that's exactly right, learning, man. That's, that's valuable. But folks who are getting into grafting, I would, I would want folks, I want to challenge your thinking. Um, I won't get on the rabbit hole that I want to with all, but I would say if you want to get into grafting, great, but do it for the experience, not the end result. Because That's if right. you're doing it just for the end result, 90% of the folks grafting itself may not be the most effective tool in the toolbox to make your own queens. There are other ways to make way better queens in your yard with your stock than grafting. And that's a conversation for a different day. So, Greg, here's what I'd like you to do. Maybe in the future, in the next few weeks, I think we should do a chat on that exact topic. Different ways to make queens and some splits. We did we do that every year, but maybe this year it can be a little different twist on it. We can focus more on different methods of, of ways that you can do that. 
Someone mentioned earlier about the flyback split that Gus Mitchell is way, way back early in the chat um, that I've got a YouTube, I got a video where I, I did an interview with Gus and I broke out a nugget, I think about that, but, but I, it works. I have done it. Thanks so much, Brian Lee. I appreciate it, man. But I, anyway, the flyback splits, I have done that. It is successful. And if you want to see how to do that, you can go back and watch some of those videos on the channel. Um, real quickly, I just appreciate everyone who's on here. We've got Redfish uh, with the four ninety nine dollars super sticker. Red Redfish is from here in Alabama, and he's been a great supporter of the chat and of the channel. Uh, thanks so much, Brian uh, Mater or Mater for the chat. Ripple Effect, thank you so much. And uh, a man who's become a great friend of mine, Brian Lee, he often calls, we talk, we text. Um, he's even helped me with my bees some. Just become a really good friend of mine, and he's a he's a um, he's kind of a you know rock in this chat here. He's been a, just a great supporter of the stream team and of our individual channels. Brian, thank you so much for that super chat. And Brian's come down, helped me with bees. He's helped me do splits. He's helped me harvest honey. And he's about three hours away in Birmingham, so he's just a great friend, great family, and uh, just just appreciate all you guys for being in here. And thanks again, Brian. Uh, question. Well, here's a question. Ripple effect. Oh, there's a question with that. How do I like the queens from Texas? Are they hot? Well, I guess it depends on who you get your queens from in Texas. Um, and Stan would be a better one to answer that question. Stan Gore, who lives there in Texas. But I've had uh, some queens from a particular, particular queen breeder where I ordered, I think, 10 and eight of them were fine and two of them were hot. And then I've got some queens from Ernie Welch in Texas. And so far, they've been really good queens. Um, they've been just you know they they some of them superseded pretty quickly but the daughters are doing great and then i have you know at least one for sure that i possibly been a graft on this year and uh, they're just doing really well and so i think it depends you know you say queens from texas that's a texas is a pretty big state you know you can't i don't think you can that's a pretty blanket statement there and so i don't i think it depends on the queen breeder and uh this same way here in alabama i mean i've got some hot bees and so you know what I mean? We got the local feral bees right here are pretty hot. And so that's kind of a, a blanket statement. And, and uh, but yeah, there are some really good cream breeders in Texas, I think, that have really good bees. A couple great comments here. Um, Larry Gandy, uh, making a queen is easy, but making a quality queen that can be a great mother is a little harder to produce. That is, um, that is, that is so painfully true. It's one thing to make something that resembles a queen. It's one thing to make one that's going to have great queens resemble her. That's a great thing. Stan has a, a, that's a heavy comment there. All Texas genetics have some Africanized. And what's an interesting thing to think about is <clears throat> if that's the case, Stan could speak, maybe we'll have to have Stan on uh, to talk about that a little bit more. But what comes to mind is you if you have any potential recessive genes that maybe doesn't didn't show up in the, the queen that you have, uh, but you have something that pops up later when a drone or the queen um, have traits that line up, or maybe a trait that isn't necessarily uh, heritable that pops up a little bit later. It's interesting to think about if all Texas genetics have some Africanized, that's that's interesting to think about. It's, it's like saying all queens um, have some Italian genetics it's crazy to think about that Texas may be at that point where there is a percentage um, of Africanized in nearly everything that comes out of Texas. I think this is, I mean, this wow, there's a lot of truth that. to this. And, it, you know, Africanized bees are extremely, now, I mean, okay, we're going down a rabbit hole here. <laughs> but I, I don't think, I don't think that all Africanized bees quote unquote, are super spicy and mean. I think, I think the truth is that, especially in the Southern part of the United States, I, I mean, I'm not looking under a microscope at these bees, but I'm guessing that we have a combination in feral bees in the South of all kinds of things. We've probably got, you know, the genetics of all different types of bees, and then it could have some Africanized traits in there. Um, but, but they are super effective at, at mite control. And I know, the queens I've gotten from Ernie Welch down there in Texas, he is, he doesn't treat. Um, and I have, 
in his original queens that I've tested, I have seen almost zero mites and they, their genetic, their attitude is fine. They're not, they're not mean or spicy. They're fine. I mean, I do, if I've been through them a time or two already and I go back in them again, like in my last video, they're a little bit fired up, but usually the first time through, they're just perfectly fine. But Ernie told me and, and, uh, Stan or Ernie, if you're on here, let me know if I'm saying this wrong, but he said basically, well, the way he breeds Queens is he goes in the most gentle, the nicest colonies that he has. And he pulls queens from those. He he grafts from those, and then he open he open mates them. But if you do that enough, eventually the drone eventually you're going to have, you know, if you continue to graft and pull bees from the nicest and the best uh, traits that you want, you're going to develop a, a an operation that's got the bees you want. But it just takes time. I know Greg, you've done some of that yourself. You've just kind of kept pulling from the best, and you've ended up with the best. And so, um, I think we got to be careful about labeling any one particular breed or type of bee as being good or bad because every bee has multiple traits and you really just got to look for what you want and then go from there so a queen that's queen talk episode in the near future i think would be really important because a lot of folks are so focused on traits that's right in behavior that they that's the only thing that they can focus on that they are missing the bigger picture, which is attributes in a much, I would rather have a colony that has a diverse set of attributes and characteristics that lead to overwinter, highly uh, productive and are frugal with their resource. I would rather have that kind of a colony than one that is necessarily just pigeonholed to be, hygienic or to be a groomer or to be this or to be that i think that's a much bigger conversation to have but i would rather have colonies that their health is manageable that are extremely productive than a colony who may be a little bit better managing on their own that aren't quite as productive or the trade-off outshines the little the, the one piece of the puzzle that we're kind of shooting for that's that's a that's a very blanket statement that's and a, there's a lot of details in there but that's a very fun conversation for later yeah we need to brian keep in track man we got some topics here we need to address in the future to okay this chat. is like the uh, this is the think tank show let's what they're gonna have to go back and someone's taking notes hopefully there's yeah. the rest of the season's uh, episodes already laid out tonight isn't there there's right. a lot Hey, uh, this is a good this is a good question here by Lonesome Bees. Uh, where do your biggest honey sales come from? Internet sales, farmers markets, produce stands, roadside. Just curious. And uh, I that's my biggest. Uh, that's that's how I make my my bee living. I guess you would say that's how I keep feeding the habit is is by selling honey. And my biggest the way I sell my honey is you know it started off word of mouth just with friends and family. And then I got approached by some stores and I have it in some stores. And that's really what kind of got me over the hump of being able to produce a lot of honey and get rid of a lot of honey. Um, we have a, a place here called Applin Farms here locally that sells. Basically, it's a, it's a farm. They produce, they produce peaches, strawberries, their own produce. Mm. It's a, but they have a couple of festivals there. Like they have a fall festival where they have like kids come out. Um, they just do all kinds of really fun, some fun events out there. It's a popular place and they have sold thousands of bottles of honey there. I hooked in with them and now I have beehives on their property. And, uh, but you just got to kind of do it that way. So the majority of my sales are sold through different various stores. I think I've got five or six or even seven stores, uh, including Applin Farms and then just some regular places like uh, places kind of like a, there's a place called, here called Shoot Pecan Company. Obviously, they sell like uh, nuts and things like that and different uh, things, kind of like a boutique that does that kind of thing. And then we have a place called Nuts to Go is kind of similar. And then just different little stores sell it. And then we have, and then I have a, I have a box out by my yard here that is just an honor box, honor system. And I've sold a lot of honey out of there. And then some people, it's just, just, ha you know, personal, uh, person to person. But I do have a website. I've sold some honey on there, but not a lot. I just, I've got a figure out how to market that better but i'm almost out of honey for the year so um i'm not trying to actively sell it now because it's about to be gone pretty soon um it just happens that way so that's that's my answer to that question do you guys have anything to add to that i know brian that's kind of what you do is you sell some honey as well yeah just you know the market's worked out um fantastic for me i mean it's just uh 
last year was great, you know, and, and I, I ended up in the boat where I've got people asking for honey now and I'm, I'm completely sold out. So other than I, I do have that bourbon barrel honey, that's going to be ready here soon, but you know, all the honey that I had gone. So, yeah. um, markets just, you know, but I mean, there are some work, you know, you got to put some work if you want to move, you know, any bit of, of honey, it does take some work. It's not easy, but it's very rewarding. I mean, it's for me, it was rewarding. So, yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you see, uh, I, I already answered this one in chat, but did you see this right here? Yeah, that is a great question. Oh yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the super chat there, Carol. Um, uh, future maybe, but not quite there yet. I, I mean, my, my, uh, my full-time job is, is very comfortable and very good. And I, you know, over the years I've thought, man, I wish I could just do something else. I'd like to have my own business and all this, but when it boils down to it, you know, it's put food on the table for a long time and I plan to continue to work here for a few more years, but the honey, the bee thing has grown. And eventually when I do retire, I will probably upscale my beekeeping operation if I'm physically able to still do that some um but but i'm at a pretty comfortable spot right now i think with the colonies i have i might get up to two or 250 kind of if i do go full time into it but you know my wife has started working uh, some and so we're, we're kind of looking towards that i'm getting towards the end of my career as a physical therapist but i'm not quite there yet so that's a great question i'm not quite ready to do that i, I you know two or three years ago i thought i was but I don't know that I am. That's a, it's a lot of work and it's a, uh, it's a risk. This past year kind of taught me with kind of the last few months, the, the, first of all, the honey flow wasn't as good. We didn't make as much honey. And then I lost a lot of bees, uh, in that one bee yard in the fall and winter here. And I, I've just kind of realized that it is farming. And it's a risk and that you can lose your shirt if you're not careful. And, uh, but of course, if I was doing it full time, I think I'd be maybe a little better at it, but I'm not quite ready to go there. Brian, how about you? Any plans on going full-time into beekeeping? <laughs> Never. Yeah. Greg, you're already there, man. So That's a loaded that's a loaded thing. And I think a lot of folks are chasing this idea that unless they are whatever full-time means, unless yeah. they're a full-time beekeeper or they're a full-time, you name the thing, that they're more or less successful than if they were less than full time or double time what it i think what it really means is if you are going into a beekeeping endeavor um this is a broad statement but you are you are literally uh have a double time occupation for a less than part-time income uh and if if that's <laughs> if that's your goal then you know that's typically where that's gonna lie but um one of the things I just want to no. quickly throw out there, Bruce, before we move on to anything else, before we close her down, is a lot of the tone that I'm hearing tonight with your scale will find itself. You you are not going to magically go from a backyard scale to a commercial or a professional or a sideliner scale overnight you if you have the disposable income to buy the equipment and the bees you can have that next scale and that shortcut and you can take that selfie and post it to the gram but that doesn't mean that that scale is actually going to be sustainable or resilient what tends to happen is the more you push uh to grow that scale will determine itself based on your ability to maintain the beast and uh, I think if you are comfortable in that constant stretch phase, then you will reach your potential um, scale faster. But in no way, shape or form is the scale that you're operating in uh, necessarily an indicator of who you are as a beekeeper um, or the quality of your beekeeping. Um, but the thing to consider for folks who are doing this financially as an endeavor, you know, you, the goals and the scale and the context in which you're operating in look a lot different. Um, but in no way, shape or form, is that a reflection of, um, I, I don't want to, too many times folks are saying, if I am not a hobbyist beekeeper, or if I don't uh, ever become a this or a that, then I somehow haven't made it or I haven't arrived to this magic moment in time where I respect myself or my work or somebody else will. 
I think you have to throw that out the window and just appreciate the journey that you were on. Because if you don't, if you can't appreciate the nine colonies you have right now, I can tell you for a fact that you will not appreciate the 90. That is, anyway, I'm not well going to get into a on that tonight. But, really yeah. quickly, there there is a video that is, it is a very good video. It's I've got it pulled up here. It's five minutes and 49 seconds long by Ian Stelper, the Canadian, Canadian Beekeepers blog from um, June 5th, 2020. It's called the 10 day rule. And that is an awesome video. It talks about exactly what you just mentioned, Greg. Um, and I can't explain it as good as Ian could, but if you go back and watch that video from Ian from a few years ago called the 10 day rule, the basic principle is, you know, the, you're going to end up with as many bees as you can care for. You know, you can grow up to 500 colonies, but if you can't take care of it, 250, you're going to end up with 250. And, uh, but the 10 day rule explains kind of what his concept or thoughts are on that. And I, it's just, it's true. It's very true. And I, I haven't applied the 10 day rule probably like I should, but, but it, it's a very true statement. He talks about, it's just a great, I, I'd encourage everyone to go check that video out. It's just a little bit of an older video from four years ago, but it's a great video, the 10 day rule. Um, so ma'am, we have really, uh, and I, I really think Greg also piggybacking on what you just said is that, you know, it doesn't matter what somebody else is doing. Nobody is better or worse because of how many colonies they have or what type of colonies they run or, you know, what their goals are. Everyone is different. That's one of the beautiful things about beekeeping is there are so many different directions you can go. Everybody's a little bit different in what their goals and aspirations are, and you can go reach those goals, you know, so you don't have to feel like you need to compare yourself or compete with anybody else. Um, I think there might be a little bit of that as, as you become a bigger business and as it becomes, you know, almost like a corporation for some of these great big gigantic companies, it might be a little bit more competitive that way. But 90, 99% of beekeepers out there just figure out what it is you want to do. And, you know, like Greg says, there's a seat at the table for everybody. You know, we're all here to help each other out. We're here to grow together. And so, um, you know, figure out what works for you, learn and glean from other people, whether it be YouTube, whether it be your mentor, whether it be your bee club or just the bees themselves, which is the most important teacher. And then just do whatever it is that you think you want to do, reach your goals and your goals are going to change as it goes along. You're going to figure things out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you as time goes on, it kind of, you hone those skills and your, and your focus becomes more focused. I guess you would say you kind of know better what you can do and what you want to do. And uh, so don't get frustrated or discouraged on what someone else says or what someone else is doing because it really doesn't matter. What matters is what you're doing and what you want to do. And then you just go ahead and, and roll with it and uh, try and achieve those goals. And if you fail, you know, like, like Brian, I guess a couple, three years ago, you lost everything, but you came back. You got some more colonies. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I've had a, just a devastating situation up in Ozark this year. So I'm trying to regroup and figure out what I'm going to do with that situation and, and uh but i fortunately i have some other bees but i'm trying to figure out how to kind of replace some of those that are lost but i i don't i mean i love it too much to give it up you know and it's taught me some things that i've learned and i'm going to move forward but that's kind of that's the beauty beekeeping is kind of like a little microcosm of life in general there's successes there's failures and uh like we talked about earlier if you could kind of put yourself in alignment with what you know your faith or what what the lord wants you to do and then and move forward if you feel it in your gut if it's what you're supposed to do then just go do it you know i feel i sound like greg a little bit although i'm not near as near as, near as uh i'm enjoying it bruce i can't i can't speak i can't speak i can't speak bruce <laughs> i don't have the way with words like greg does but i feel like i'm not on the soapbox here. I need to all you have to do is hold your words together and have a mush mouth like me and then you can talk like me anytime you want <laughs> 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 all right phyllis hey it's been fun well, tonight guys yeah well i think we'll start talking about here as the weeks start to unfold uh exactly kind of what we're all doing uh, in the bee yards but i was so excited to just jump right into this chat and just like announce to the entire world all the things that are going on right now uh, i'd enjoy the way the the conversation unfolded there's a there's a lot of times there is um there is what you think you're going to talk about, and then there is what needs to talk, what needs to be talked about, and that's the direction that these things go when your mind and your heart are open to that. Uh, and so I think that was a lot of great uh, content. I really appreciate all the conversation in the chats here, and uh, Bruce and Brian. 
it's it's a, an incredible this this I wanted to, to officially um, officially announce not unofficially or superficially or artificially but officially announce that the beekeeping season for us at Nature's Image Farm officially starts this week mm. and while the beekeeping season really started about July um, us getting out and really starting to spend more time cracking lids and going through colonies start now because I should say not because a social media expert gave me the permission to get into my colonies and crack lids and pull out frames and not because uh, somebody with a huge mouthpiece uh, said it was okay, but because the bees are out uh, and they are looking for anything and everything. But the most important reason why is I'm looking to the bees and guess where the bees are looking at right now? Those bees are starting to buzz the maples and those maples are getting ready to explode. When those maple trees bloom and they are producing that pollen, it is absolutely full on. So for us, yeah. looking at nature for the cue, not the calendar, not for man's interpretation, looking to the trees themselves, we're going to have bloom here in just a few days. So for us, I'm really excited because that means I am out putting pollen patties on. That is what we're going to try to get done this week is get pollen patties on. The fondant, we are done with fondant now the rest of the year because everything is going so warm and the flowers and the ground temps and the trees are all going towards spring, meaning producing food. We're going to do the same thing. And we're going to start putting those, getting those pollen patties on right now. No more fondant. So for me, that's exciting because not only are we putting the fondant on, we're getting through and we're going to get all the brood cleaned up uh, with osalic acid and just keep things moving forward in that right direction. And uh, it's it's pretty cool. So that's kind of what we're up to the next week or so. We're, we're busy here. Uh, Bruce uh, wax dipping like crazy. One, one thing I wanted to, to I, I just got to, if I ever forget to say this, one of the things that have been on our heart is one of the Proverbs where a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And it was absolutely an honor for us this week. We just, we just shipped out an entire semi load of wax dip boxes to a retiring beekeeper wow. who is leaving behind an inheritance and in, and is in, in his last year is making a purchase for his children and his children's children in a wax dip box, a box lasting decades. To me, there are so many ways to in interpret and how we go about doing that in life, but I don't believe in coincidence. And so when we're reading uh, in proverb and that scripture comes up and the, when we're shipping out that for somebody with their intent is to leave something behind for their sons and their grandchildren in the way of beekeeping equipment, that is pretty cool. When you learn to speak the language and you and you start to understand and see God for who he is, you see it in all things, every aspect of your life, including your work, including the things that you are putting your hands to and including the things that are keeping your lights on here because all of that only exists because God cast the net and gave us the wisdom to harvest. So that, I wanted to share that was a pretty, pretty cool thing. But the beekeeping, the, the beekeeping year, starts this week and I'm, I'm pretty excited about that here in my area it's go time isn't it yeah why don't we kind of go around the horn here and we'll start to kind of wrap it up um once again if we if i wanted to thank all those who have are participating in the chat tonight i appreciate uh, appreciate these super chats and, and it's everyone who's contributing anyway tonight um let's see i think we talked about carol ripple effect i'm in texas none of my bees are africanized right here thanks for the super chat ripple effect uh clay brun uh bunner uh, thanks for the super sticker we appreciate everyone for for chipping in here and um, it means a lot to us but um uh, brian why don't you go ahead and uh talk about the next little while for you i know we discussed a little bit at the beginning of the chat but um kind of let's let's wrap it up here and and uh what's going on in your neck of the woods for the next uh, little while and then i'll go and then we'll let Greg wrap it up like yeah. he's so good at doing. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to get over. And uh, I think in the next two weeks, it's 
it's going to be key for me to get everything set up so that when the season busts open, that everything is ready. So it's just more or less I'm going to get over, get the yard cleaned up some, get hive stands and everything positioned. And, uh, you know, I do have to go through and count the equipment and do all that. So, um, but my room, this is, you know, every time I go drive down there, my building that I have, um, it's it's getting pretty loaded. <laughs> so, but, you know, I'm going to go through the equipment and just get everything ready because if I... Uh, dilly dally if if i you know procrastinate it's just the season's going to leave me behind and then you know i don't want to start this year with the plans i have i don't want to end up chasing it i want to be ready so that at least you know if i'm running neck and neck with it that'll be fine so i, I don't want with what i have planned i don't want to feel like i'm stressed out because i'm adding more you know, worries, more concerns. So I just want to get things ready. So that'll be the next, you know, um, next few days. Probably I want to <laughs> hold hard. That's funny. That'll be the next few days of, of what I want to get done. So um, it'll, it'll be good though. You know, that's, that's the first step, like what Greg's going to be doing, you know, tossing on patties and that I think for me, that'll be like my first step here for getting the season ready. Cause I'm getting the yard squared away for where I'm going to place things. So it'll be good. Yeah, Stan, we're all, or Brian, we're all open to see some videos about uh, your single brood chamber adventures. Stan, so trust me. Uh, they're coming, you'll huh? see it. And Stan, when I do screw up, because I probably will screw something up, you'll see it. <laughs> yeah. As far as me down here in Southeast Alabama, you know, I think the, videos ago i said beekeeping season is here and that is true we're in we're you know it's the weather's inconsistent but the bees don't care they're just plowing ahead and i had to get a little bit just crazy trying to get it done this past weekend with the weather the way it was so this weekend i'm gonna go out and see if i <laughs> hopefully they're all okay i was I, um we'll see how that ended up but i pulled out of i pulled 21 splits so we're going to see how they're doing but um, you know, my goal is to grow. I'd like to get up to, you know, I'd like to get up to the point where I can maintain, you know, a few more hives than what I have now. And, uh, just, I want to make the, the amount of honey I made a couple of years ago was perfect for me. At least, uh, I got rid of the honey. I had the last honey in the bottling tank when we harvested this past year. Um, this past year we had about half as much, I had about half as much to sell and I'm almost out. And so, I'd like to figure out how to have more consistent results, how to be more efficient. And my goal is to get back to the basics this year. Um, the things that worked for me the first few years, I want to go back to some of those roots and not necessarily try every little thing that's out there. You know, I want to kind of go back to my roots and, and just the things that kept my healthiest bees healthy and with some of the new knowledge that I have and not be so caught up in trying every little thing that's out there you know it's easy especially being in youtube you see everything out there and you want to try everything but it, everything you try takes time and that's something i don't have a lot of so um that's kind of my goal back to the basics grow a little bit more kind of build my numbers back up and then just pull honey harvest honey and and uh probably the number one goal will be to become more efficient and uh to be a better beekeeper and all in tr truth i'd like to make better videos and continue to grow the channel and continue to grow the stream team thing in the community that we have started here, both through my channel and through the stream team. It's just been a phenomenal opportunity. Look forward to meeting more of you as we travel a little bit more and get out and, and also at conferences and just in, in the comment sections. It's all just phenomenal. So that's where, where I'm at this new beekeeping season. I have a lot of hope, a lot of excitement, and I'm sure there's going to be some curveballs thrown my way. There's going to be curveballs thrown each of our way, but just got to adjust go ahead and hit the ball and move forward greg why don't you take it away man let's well, bring it home we appreciate everyone spending time with us tonight i mean it's um we learn so much uh from the feedback that we get from folks and uh it's it's an honor for us to spend time with you and uh, I, w I won't say have your year there's a lot of folks you can be hearing be, be stuff from but we appreciate you spending time in this fellowship uh, the stream team beekeeping chat next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Whose channel is that on, fellas? It's coming on, I think. Is it Greg's, Brian? 
Yeah. It's on your channel, Greg, next week. Okay. So uh, we'll, we'll come up with something fun to talk about then. Uh, so many great – This is, it's so exciting because, you know, it's not that November, December, January, February is not super exciting, but, you know, we're all ramping up to where we'll all be in – the thick of it before too much longer. And it's I what I enjoy about this chat is hearing from so many different folks kind of where they're at with their beekeeping, kind of where we three are at in their different parts. Um, even though Brian and I are only a couple of three hours, two and a half hours apart, we're we might as well be in different states. So it's yeah. it's fun to kind of just learn uh, how we all are kind of cluing into those things. So that's pretty cool. I would encourage folks uh, if you're checking out this chat later once it publishes to YouTube is leave us some comments below and let us know what are you doing right now uh, with your bees? Are you getting started? Are you prepping your equipment? Are you, uh, are you purchasing all the last minute things? Uh, let us know in the comments below. Um, that's always fun to kind of see too. Um, oh, I did want to say this. We've got, uh Oh, we are, we are now fully stocked. If you go to our website, naturesimagefarm.com, we are fully stocked wow. on the, uh, the Instant Vap Compacts. It, what a slick unit, guys. Mm -hmm. um, I love my original Instant Vap, but I got to tell you, this one is, I just love it. Uh, more importantly, you know who loves this more than me? Susie. And now that's a win. You know what I was going to do? I, I wasn't sure if I was going to get in trouble, though, but she, she's over there working the computer on that end. What I was going to do, because she can't hear us and she's not going to watch this chat back, especially not this late or ever. I was actually going to wrap that up and give it to her for a Valentine's Day present on the last chat. But I'm thinking, uh, I'm not sure how that would go. But anyway, that's, like, that's like giving her a vacuum cleaner, Greg. I don't know if I'd go that far. I, if I wouldn't do that. <laughs> hey, boss. Hey, <laughs> hey, boss. 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 I got something for you. Oh. You know what's better than giving to this for um, for for everyone who's, who doesn't know? Um, it, Valentine's Day's passed, Hi, Susie. But, but Susie's birthday is March first. March first, Susie. I got it. She's gonna be twenty five again. Birthday huh? to you. I'm gonna have that engraved with your name on it. But um, here, let me get a marker. We'll write. We'll put your name on it that way. Greg, you know, every time she hits that plunger, she's gonna be thinking <laughs> of your head. <laughs> Good thing, Let's vaporize Greg. Woo! good thing we've got extra extra plungers there because she's going to be whacking a whack-a-mole and thinking of me and this awesome but uh anyways we got a, a shipment of those vaporizers in and also uh hive alive patties we've got um some appamate bottom boards and we've got uh, some really cool uh our endure hive wax dipped hive kits are on the website too we're freshing up the website we've got some really cool stuff hitting the website Later on this week, naturesimagefarm.com. Make sure to check it out. Not only are you going to see it on our place, you're going to start to see this thing everywhere. And I don't want to let the cat out of the bag yet, but we are so blessed, humbled, and honored to be a part of uh, what God is doing with our family and what God is doing with our business. He continues to open doors that we couldn't even think to knock on. And all we do is walk through and trust. Uh, and I, we thank him for all of that naturesimagefarm.com. Check us out. We'd love to earn your business. If there's something that we can do, packages, queens, nukes, or supplies, uh, we'd love to earn your business. Next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, Nature's Image Farm will probably be a marriage counseling session on the repercussions of giving your wife an instant VAP 18-volt compact as an early birthday present. Be there or be square. Folks, thanks for spending time with us. We appreciate you so much. Leave us a comment below. Let us know what are you doing right now? What are you prepping and planning for for spring? We'll look forward to seeing those comments later on. As always, we want to remind you to be the lighthouse and be the change you want to see in this world. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.